welcome to the cockpit. My name's Ryan, and I'm never on time. I, I apologize, boys and girls. I uh, I got home late from work, like literally at like 7:55. Not happy. I'll go into that in a little bit. I'm a little frustrated. I have my co-pilot Green Bean here with me. Green Bean, how you doing tonight? Me, I'm awesome, man. I'm uh, I'm I'm okay with you being a few minutes late. I think it's totally fine. And I'm in a better mood because of it. I love it. Boys and girls, we will have Matt O'Leary joining us right around 9 o'clock or so. Uh, he's got to take care of some other stuff, and then he'll hop on with us at that point. We're going to give away a shirt today. We have... So I got, I got two things for you guys. So one, if you guys saw my most recent video, we're going to be giving out a jersey for each one of the first round picks this year in the draft all you have to do is click on the first link in the description down below that'll take you to the first day of our draft live stream uh, all you have to do is put a comment down below that don't do it in the live chat do it in like the the, the below chat so it doesn't disappear <laughs> so, so do, go over there that's how you get entered to do that and then secondly for the shirt giveaway tonight super secret shirt top secret if you want to get that i pinned a twitter page to the top of this live stream this dude, Sack Exchange, is so legit. The guy is absolutely awesome. All you have to do is go to that Twitter page. You have to follow him, and you have to retweet that tweet, and then just tag uh, myself and Green Bean and Matt in it as well, and retweet that out. That'll get you entered to win a super secret shirt at the end of the stream. So someone who retweets that is going to get that. Link in the description down below is for the jersey giveaway on draft night. So make sure you head over to there. There's a bunch of really cool um, chances to win some stuff. And you get to help out some really cool people. Sack Exchange, right literally on. the coolest dude. One of the most generous guys. This guy legitimately, like, he's watching the draft. He ran into uh, a, an older Jet fan, a, a guy who doesn't have anyone to watch the draft with. Literally does not know this guy at all. He invited him into his house to watch the draft. That's how awesome of a Jet fan this guy is. I love it. That's exactly how all, you know, the whole Jet community should work, helping each other out. I 100% love everything this guy's doing. So please head over to the pinned comment in the chat. If you don't even want the shirt, if you just want to help recognize an absolutely awesome person, just send a retweet his way and tag me, O'Leary, and Green Bean in that. So that way you guys could get your chance to win a shirt at the end of the stream as well. Um, so really, really cool dude has helped out the channel a lot. Um, all right. <laughs> Scott Wilson, yeah, he's the best, man. With... He, he's the best just to, just to kind of follow you there and, uh, dovetail with you. I mean, the mm -hmm. guy, he just, he's constantly, we, you know, it blows my mind. Like he's not just giving away like 30 cent pieces or whatever. It looks like it's, it's like all the way from cards to, you know, different memorabilia to sign jerseys and he pays for the shipping. It's mm -hmm. incredible, man. So he deserves a follow, and not for nothing, guys, you can win something really cool. I think he's awesome. I love him. I'm going to be meeting him in Coney Island. We're putting together a meetup when I'm up there at the Cyclone, and we'll keep you posted. But, yeah, man, go over there and give him a follow and uh, maybe win some shit. Yeah. It's absolutely <laughs> awesome. This guy's a, a really, really good dude from the bottom of his heart. He just cares, you know, about everything. Uh, Scott Wilson drops in with a super chat, says, ever realized how much O'Leary looks like the priest in Gran Torino? I have no idea who that is off the top of my head. I've seen Gran Torino, but now I got to Now I got to look it up. Yeah, Gran Torino is a great see. movie, but I, I don't oh, know who fantastic. the priest is. When saw it once. I have no idea who the priest is, and now I got Now I got to pull it up to see who it is. Uh, I guess I'm probably just looking for like a redheaded guy. <laughs> That's like, uh, let's see, what's his name? Oh man, these are all so small. I don't know. It doesn't even say that. Oh, Father Janovich. Oh, 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 there it is. Okay, let's see. Yeah. Where'd he go? Now I gotta see. Oh, that's that's baloney. He does not look like that at all. It's literally just some guy with freckles and red hair, but legit legitimately does not look anything like O'Leary. <laughs> like no. not in the slightest. No. <laughs> That's like every, everyone thinks that all redheads look exactly alike, which is right. You know, not 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 entirely wrong. <laughs> it's the red hair is definitely a uh, you know a little. 
kind of uniqueness yeah well i guess you could yeah you could say they have a similarity right yeah Yeah, that's that's about it oh i'm bumping into my microphone as i'm trying to open up my refreshment for this evening um all right so i guess let's let's talk a little bit about the (laughs) can i pull it up on the stream i'm not gonna pull it up on the stream because it's just not it's not even like it's not worth my time to try and figure this out (laughs) go look up Gran Torino and look up the the cast list and it's father something or other, but it's like a, a chubby, <laughs> like a redheaded guy. Uh, <laughs> does not look like him. Uh, Liam's asking, what do I have to retweet to enter the giveaway? It's pinned in the, uh, the live chat. So if you go over to the live chat, the pinned comment at the very top is a tweet from Sack Exchange. Um, all you have to do is retweet that and just tag me, Green Bean, and O'Leary in that. Uh, and then you'll be entered to win a shirt at the end of the stream. But you got to follow him as well. Got to follow him as well. It's not not just a, yeah. a retweet thing. Right. Um, so easy to right. do, Ryan. Isn't it easy? It is. To it's, give us oh, I've the sub I, or to follow. It's the easiest yeah. thing in the world. <laughs> so so easy. easy. All right. So let's jump into a. Oh nope. You know what? Hold on. I gotta. I gotta do yeah. the whole pace and bills thing. I so I didn't. I didn't do it. I'm That's a right. bad, bad influencer. <laughs> I, I want to talk about yeah. my uh, my green beans a little bit. Oh, they just gave me a new read, too. Can I find the new read in time to not screw this up? Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, uh, all right. Let's see if this is it. All right. Hey, you. Yeah, you. Got Bush? <laughs> you definitely do if you haven't tried the best products from our sponsor today. Manscaped. After using these life-changing products, you're going to want to join a ball sack beauty contest. <laughs> I'm looking out for you too because I have an exclusive 20% off discount code. Promo code JETSTALK will get you 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com. So if you want to get one of those... Head over to that. This is like this is a, a read that I did not try to read prior to this. I just knew that they sent it to me, so I'm like laughing oh, at this no. whole thing as it's going on. This is oh, this is ridiculous. Uh, sorry, my files. I know, <laughs> not, not, not the best. Uh, all right, you guys are asking me where's the goat because there's supposed to be a little thing that goes across, and I didn't I didn't download that. I'm I'm bad at this. Uh, all right, so let's talk a little bit about the Jets. Not the not the second overall pick because we're all dialed in. We're getting a quarterback at two. Everyone thinks it's Zach Wilson. I think that's who it's going to be. I think that's that's basically yeah. what it's like. All it could possibly be. I shouldn't say that, but no, Zach no, Wilson number you shouldn't. two. So, <laughs> I know I'm digging myself a deeper hole. So I know pick twenty three and pick thirty four. Now that we know it's going to be quarterback at two, what do you think we should be looking at at pick twenty three and thirty four? When I was going through my mock draft that i put out yesterday or two days ago whatever day that was now every day is blending together at this point um i had the jets going i i said quitty pay jc horn and elijah vera tucker were not available at my pick and then i went with caleb farley the cornerback uh from virginia because he's considered a top 10 talent but he has the back injury and there's a lot of issues with that um I think the only other player that I'd probably consider at that, I I shouldn't say only other player, but roughly what I'm kind of looking at is Creed Humphrey. Cause I could understand an argument and actually in our mock draft that we did on your channel the other day, uh, I actually took Creed Humphrey with the 23rd pick and then Uh you could go with Wyatt Davis at 34 and then you just completely rebuild that line. And that's kind of where I would be okay with going. My mindset was that I think they want to roll with McGovern at center. So I went with the cornerback in fairly. Um, now, or Farley, Farley. Um, yeah, I was gonna let it slide, so, man. I was. No, nah, I was gonna say I was. I'm, I said it. I was like, that's not right at all. Um, <laughs> so I was actually looking at Newsom. I was looking at Greg Newsom, the cornerback from Northwestern, I believe. Uh, and yeah, I was like, oh, you know what? I don't want to take Farley because he's he's had injuries and whatnot. Let me go with Newsom. And I started looking into him. The guy's never played a full season. <laughs> so I'm like, wait, why am yeah. I looking at injuries for Farley? But I'm not looking at. Uh, 
at injuries for Newsom. So I, that's how I landed on Farley. I know some people not too happy, some people want other stuff. So Green Bean, I'll ask you this: What would you prefer us to do at pick twenty three? Um. All right. Well, let me say this. I'll I'll give you a detailed, in depth answer here. So. Number one, outside of quarterback, the offensive line is the strongest position in this draft. It's almost not even arguable. Like offensive line is, this is the offensive line draft. So with that said, you're going to be able to get really plug and play offensive linemen probably all the way until the third round. You know what I mean? Really, le- like legitimately and realistically, you're going to be able to get guys at 66 and 86 that can plug that you can just put in and start most likely. All right. So mm-hmm. the edge rusher draft have uh, class happens to be the weakest position almost like, it's like really, a, it's like edge rusher and then uh, like safety and things like that. Um, mm-hmm. So in the event you are thinking, I want to get an edge rusher and offensive lineman from this draft. It might make sense to use 23 because, uh, you know, on an edge or even cornerback, cornerback's a little you know, weaker than offensive line as well. If you like somebody up top, just going ahead and taking the cornerback like a Caleb Farley. I mean, the injuries scared the hell out of me. Uh, I don't like using a third round. I mean, a first round pick on an injured guy. But, you know, you do your tests and, and all this stuff and you vet them. And if you like them, you like them. But getting a cornerback or an edge rusher could make a lot of sense. Because in the third round, the edge rushers there are more than likely going to be developmental. So, you know, there's a logic there. There's a logic with saying, hey, I'm going to take, you know, Patrick Jones, Carlos Basham at, at 23 or 34 and then pushing offensive line to the following pick and even maybe just double up in the third round kind of thing. Now, that all said, what I would do is I would get the offensive line done. I don't care. I, you know, I'd, I'd watch the board, you know, if somebody like a Quiddy Pay is popping through, somebody like a JC Horn is popping through, you know, you, you have to pay attention to that stuff. Um, but that all said and done, I think that you're going to use a, a number two pick on a quarterback. I think you use the next premium picks you have on ensuring that the offensive line is going to protect him. Because listen, man, I know everybody doesn't want to talk about Zach Wilson's weaknesses. And the the level of competition, nobody lets you say that. Ah, blah blah. They they don't let you do that. But the truth is, is he's not used to pressure, man. He's he's had comfortable time in the pocket for the larger sum of his year, you know, of his time in college. So if you're gonna bring him in, get put him in his comfort zone and protect his ass. So, uh, but yeah, man, it could be there is logic to go edge rusher because you're not gonna be able to get the same quality. In the even in the second, but definitely in the third and fourth later on. Yeah, and I think that's kind of where I fall um, value wise. Like, if we don't get a good edge rusher at twenty three, I'm almost okay with like foregoing it a little bit longer. Like then waiting till like our second, third round pick possibly. Um, I don't think it's as critical. Ooh, sorry, Bert. Um, I'd almost uh-huh. rather like I don't think we're going to be very good this year. So if I had the option to bolster the offensive line and make Zach Wilson feel comfortable, I'm okay with going Creed Humphrey 23, Wyatt Davis 34, and then addressing our other needs as we go. And if it means putting corner off or putting edge rusher off for another year, it sucks, and I know it's going to be frustrating. But I think having two first round picks next year allow you that opportunity to go edge rusher and corner in next year's draft if the value does not line up with what we want this year. Uh, now, all that said, it depends how they feel about Clark. Maybe they really like Clark. We didn't get to see anything from him last year. So uh, I see HMNI in there. I don't know how to pronounce that, but he Kadoza. says Cam Clark going to surprise a lot of people. Kadoza. Kadoza. That's what yeah. I should have just called him. That would have made way yeah, more I sense than me. <laughs> me butchering that um yeah. so at at 34 did it did you get into where you want to go at 34 i know you said you you'd like to fix the offensive line but i wasn't sure if i just asked you about 23 
Well, yeah, well, look, I, I think the way that I would probably do this is I would look for the top interior offensive lineman at 30 at 23. I would so like if it's Creed Humphrey, it's Creed Humphrey. Mm -hmm. If it's, you know, Wyatt Davis, it's Wyatt Davis. I would I would grab one of those two guys. And then at 34, I would check the lay of the land. But uh, and mm -hmm. see who's slipping, because remember, 34 is that it's, it's the second pick in the second day. You have all night to evaluate what just happened and look at mm -hmm. it. But I think it would probably I don't think they're going to go to offensive linemen in a row. I just I, I struggle to see it. So I think that's probably where they'll get a cornerback because edge has at least been addressed in free agency. And like you just said, you could mm -hmm. push edge rusher to next year and just really shore up the positions that this draft is, is a little bit stronger in. So get your offensive linemen, get three of them, get two starters and a pipeline guy, get two cornerbacks or, you know, two defensive backs. You know, uh, you, you're going to need an outside guy and a nickel guy. So we need, you know, it might be wise to just go 34 and grab, you know, whoever's slipping there. I can't even think of the guy, but maybe like even an, you know, Eric Stokes. It's a little early for Stokes probably, but Eric Stokes – um, I love him, man. I think uh, he's a he would be a good get, even though he struggles a little bit in the uh, man. I think uh, he's got a lot to work with. So, but somebody like that, if they're sitting there, you might want to you might want to go ahead and grab them. But sure. yeah, I w I wouldn't yeah I wouldn't have a problem with them going offensive line, twenty three and thirty four. I think, man, if you're just gonna go in this and go, well, I'm done talking about offensive line. We're getting Zach Wilson and we're getting Creed Humphrey. And I'm getting, the, you know, the top guard on the board. And then we're calling this one a wrap. And then I'll get some developmental guys in the in the fourth and sixth. You know what I mean? Just ending this bullshit. I, I'd be all for that. Yeah, you just kind of, like, get this offensive line finished. We can, we can, like, look at our stable of running backs. We can watch our quarterback have a little bit more time back there. I saw some people, like, real upset, like, oh, Sam Darnold was a higher-rated – uh, you know, quarterback coming out, then Zach Wilson, why would we waste our pick, blah, 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 Zach Wilson, that level of competition, and this, that, and the other thing. Well, he's playing with guys of equal caliber talent on his team to the opponents that he's facing. And he has, I was looking at the stats, so Sam Darnold's career low in interceptions in college is... Zach Wilson's high in interceptions in college, <laughs> like nine, I think it was nine interceptions or something like that. It's like, all right, well, like, so you're, you, you think one's better than the other, but Zach Wilson doesn't turn the ball over like at all. And his bad year is Sam's good year. Like, yeah, I, you know, and that's a good point And it's definitely important. But again, the, the one thing that leads to interceptions more than anything else is pressure. So when, when pressure's really not existent, I know dude, people have sent me numerous videos and clips of Zach Wilson under pressure. Um, the truth is, is what I've seen, and I've seen a lot of it, he doesn't fare as well with pressure in his face. He doesn't. Lots of incompletions, lots of errant wide passes and things like that. But the, the interceptions come when somebody is under pressure. That's when it comes, or they have to make a play, like, you know, all the guys are covered and they got to run around that, that kind of stuff. Sam Darnold had a lot more of that in college than Zach Wilson did. And look, you know, I want to just say, I'm not against Zach Wilson. I like the pick. If that's what we do, I think it's great. All that shit, but I just can't seem to understand why there's like this. He's flawless. Like I saw some things they were saying, he's literally Mahomes and Rogers in one. I'm like, really? Really? That's what we're seeing here? Like, we're seeing a guy that's a hybrid of Aaron Rodgers and Patrick Mahomes, the two, two of the top three quarterbacks in the league? Like, I don't know. And it's like, again, like, pressure is what makes you throw picks. Pressure is what makes you rush throws. And Zach Wilson did not have a lot of it. So that's my concern. So then, and that's what I'm saying, Ryan. If you want this guy to succeed – Put him in that exact same position. Mimic that, man. Get him comfortable back there. Do a Brady. No one touches Zach Wilson. And if you're going to do that, use your first two picks on offensive line. 
I think those are all valid points. And I want to, let me just put up a, uh, a comment real quick. Uh, Zach Wilson, PFF. Whoops, PFFFFFF. <laughs> My computer lagged. <laughs> it's like, oh, geez. Um, all right. So, PFF draft grades. Okay. That's not how you spell grades, Ryan. Elementary, my dear Watson. Um, all right, so real quick, let me let me get into a super chat. Uh, Mutt File says, is it just me or does Zach Wilson look like Troy Bolton from High School Musical? Pick 23, cornerback, pick 34, uh, Davis at guard. Uh, so Troy Bolton is Zach Efron from High School Musical. I don't necessarily see it because he doesn't have like kind of, not the slick back hair, but like the spiked up hair. He's got more of like a, I don't want to say a mop, but more of like a long hair flow kind of thing he's got going on um so i don't know if i necessarily agree with that uh now in terms of zach wilson's grades on pro football focus because i was interested because you were saying that uh a lot of guys or he's, he's not great with the uh pressure which i can understand he had one of the best offensive lines uh in college football last year so uh, in yeah. pro football focuses everything uh, his pressure grade was definitely his worst, but it's still a pretty good grade. So passing grade was a 95.5, uh, intermediate passing grade, 93.9, deep passing grade, 99.9, no pressure grade, 96.5. And then his pressure grade was a 74.1. So it's 20 points lower on however they grade their metrics. Um, right. again, probably a grain of salt with all this. When we're looking yeah, always, at his always. analysis, like the the what they're saying, his pros and cons are his biggest strength. They list as off platform arm talent, which seems to check out. Uh, and then his biggest weakness, like you said before, it says untested under pressure. So I think they yeah. probably didn't have a lot to go after on this. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll go through. There's they list four positives and three negatives. So I'll go into each one real quick. Um, this is good. Okay, I'm ready. Yeah, I, I haven't really dove into the whole like draft side of things with Pro Football Focus, but it's actually really cool. Uh, so yeah. pros, they say uncoachable off-platform arm talent doesn't need his feet set to deliver strikes. Check. That's absolutely everything we've seen. Pinpoint on every level of the field, ranked in the top five in off-target rate this season. I would say that makes sense. It, it seems like he can hit every throw across the board. Uh, he's got a flick release no wasted movement or wind up to get the ball out quickly. I see that. Honestly, I think he has one of the best releases in this draft class. Like when I watch Fields and I watch Lawrence, they seem to have more of like a wind up motion to it where his is kind of like a pop, boom, like, and it's out. And maybe I, I don't know any timing on, on, you know, snap to throw or any of that sort of stuff, but it just looks from the visual aspect, looks like he's getting it out a lot quicker. Um, and then yeah. his final his final positive that they gave him was Houdini in the pocket can get himself out of tight quarters under pressure, uh, which is going to help when he doesn't have a great offensive line <laughs> next year with us potentially. Uh, now his cons, his gun his cons are where we kind of get into some of the uh, the protection and things like that. So had all day behind one of the best offensive lines in the country. Some games were glorified seven on seven. Uh, they say trust arm almost too much at times and won't set feet on throws. So it seems like he trusts his arm to make that off balance throw that off platform throw. And he would be better off setting his feet and making the throw when you know he can connect on it as opposed to just like going for it. Cause he may not be able to hit those types of windows in the NFL with NFL caliber speed at the cornerback position. So I think that's something to uh to take note of and then his final one is injuries limited him to one year of high level production against a group of uh of five only schedule a group of five only schedule um huh. i don't know what that means maybe it's just like whatever conference yeah. they have um so basically the the injury thing for me it seems like all his medicals have checked out so it doesn't seem like yeah. the injuries are going to be lingering at all but it does leave you a little bit of like, oh, man, I really wish we saw him 2019 without the injury because he was recovering from shoulder injury. So when you say like, oh, you know, he didn't have a great 2019, it's like, all right, yeah, he had, didn't have a great 2019 because he's recovering from, you know, a torn, uh, what was it, a... Uh, Rotator cuff, wasn't it? 
It wasn't rotator cuff. It was like no. a uh, – no, it was – someone's going to say it in the chat. Lab Turf I, I think it was labrum. That sounds right. I think he tore his labrum and – is it labrum in both shoulders? Someone will say it in the chat, and they'll be like, yo, you yeah. got to know your stuff. We're drafting this court. Yeah, Labor, there know. it is. Da da right. David yeah. drops in. See, that's just it. There it is. That, they, they, they are the fact check <laughs> in the chat. I that's love it. That's it, right. Oh, look. See, Everybody look. We got a bunch of labels. encyclopedia now. Well, that's Everybody's just it. He tore one of them. <laughs> I think he tore one of them in high school, and then he tore the opposite one at the – some point in 2019 or was recovering in 2019 toward the end of 2018 yeah. I, I don't know it was some, something along that um so he yeah. tore it once in each shoulder but it seems like it's checked out and it seems like it's not a concern uh for a lot of players uh in terms of his advanced 2020 statistics uh we'll go into this real quick so uh adjusted completion percentage so this is the balls that he threw towards wide receivers that they should have caught so it factors out drops it takes away uh, intentionally thrown balls out of bounds, spiked balls, you know, trying to clock the ball or clock the clock the time or whatever. Uh, and I think it removes, I think there's one other thing, but basically what his completion percentage could have been in an ideal situation if everyone caught the balls and you didn't factor in all that other stuff. 80.3, that was tied for fifth in the country. Um, his average depth of target was 10.9 yards that tied for 31st in the country big time throw rate 8.6 percent that was ninth in the country turnover worthy play rate that was one percent that is tied for second in the country deep yards 1286 that was tied or not tied that was third in the country uh screen yards 318 screen yards that was 18th in the country uh, his drop rate for, I guess, receivers dropping the ball was a 4.7. They don't list how, like, where that ranked. Uh, pressure to sack conversion rate was a 13.9%. Again, there's no sort of gauge on that. I don't know where that falls. Oh, average time to throw. So this is actually interesting. We can actually oh, yeah, get into this if we wanted to. Average time to throw was 2.81 seconds. So that was tied for 97th. So average time to throw is from when he snaps the ball to when the ball is released from his hand, not just his throwing motion. It's it's legitimately how much time his offensive line gave him and how fast he was able to make a decision and get the ball into the receiver's hands. So that's a little and tricky to, to kind of deal with. It is, but that would be a but that's a positive, you know. If he's able to identify the target because he's not always hitting his first read. So if we can go through his progression to his second read let the ball go out of his hands in 2.9 seconds. That's a positive. That's a, that's a mm. good stat. Um, you know, but the thing is too, it's like, I, I like, you know, I like to try to consider everything. Like I know this is probably the guy. So everybody likes mm. to try to paint them in the best light. I mean, that's natural. We, you know, people do that. You want your guys to be good and everything, but it's really important, man. So like if this guy has not had enough, uh, under pressure throws for PFF to even really give us stat on. They can't even really give their opinion on it. Like, and, and th those types of things, it's like, we need to make sure like this is, and he had the two torn labrum. So like, we have to make sure this guy stands upright the whole time. You have to put your most valuable resources in that aspect of the game because he has the two injuries and he's not used to being pressured. And uh, let me tell you, man, the NFL is not college, as many guys, even from the bigger schools, find that out. So I'm just, he makes me nervous. Like I said, I like him. If the Jets and Joe Douglas like him, I trust it. I, I sincerely do. But he makes me nervous. And I would love, love, love for the Jacksonville Jaguars to bite on the hype and leave Trevor Lawrence for us. I would love it. So let's – Let's do this. This is this is going to be fun. So let's play uh, a little game. And chat, you can play along with us if you want. Um, I'm going to compare Zach Wilson's stats to Trevor Lawrence. I have the same metrics pulled up on both sides, so we can kind of have an idea of where they stand. Um, I'll rattle off. So let's see. I'll go through the first five that I went through initially. Passing grade, Zach Wilson, 
Trevor Lawrence, 90.3. I'm sorry, but what is this exactly? So all the stats I just read off for Zach Wilson, I have Trevor Lawrence's draft profile pulled up as well. So I'm I'm just curious where Pro Football Focus ranks these two guys across the board. Um, So passing grade, Zach Wilson, 95.5. Trevor Lawrence, 90.3. Intermediate passing grade, Zach Wilson, 93.9. Intermediate for Wilson, 90.2. Advantage, Wilson. Deep grade, 99.9 for Wilson. 97.7 for Trevor. So, it, I mean, these are like splitting hairs, most of this stuff. Uh, no pressure grade, Zach Wilson, 96.5. Trevor Lawrence, 92.6. So, Zach Wilson has beaten him in all those categories uh, yeah. to start. Pressure grade. Trevor Lawrence's pressure grade was a 55.1. Trevor Lawrence's was a 74. Or, sorry. Zach Wilson's was a 74.1. Trevor Lawrence was a 55.1. So there's like a 20-point swing on the pressure with uh, with Trevor Lawrence. Uh, in yeah. terms of his, like, the analysis, they say Trevor Lawrence's biggest strength is his timing. His biggest weakness is his accuracy. Um, we go through, he says, every game is a laser show. His arm strength to uh, has the arm strength to open up the entire field. He's unparalleled processing speed as well as coverage, blitz recognition, uh, pocket presence and manipulation already at an NFL level, rarely takes sacks. Sneaky wheels will outrun linebackers in space. Those were the pros for Trevor Lawrence. The cons for Trevor Lawrence won't give up on plays. Uh, some ugly force throws outside of the pocket. Airmail tendency came to a head versus LSU as a sophomore not the most pinpoint passer can get locked and can get locked onto his first read too much knows talented wide receiver corpse usually wins so they're basically saying I, I for me when i'm looking at both these i think the ceiling is higher on wilson but the floor is significantly higher on trevor lawrence and i think that's where that kind of goes and then let's go into the adjusted completion percentage and all that sort of stuff cuz th- those were kind of interesting just- to Mm-hmm. But is this just is this 2020 or is this their career? This is I so I, actually I do not know. I believe this to be 2020, but I could be right. could be wrong on this. Um, the the analysis of him seems to be his career. The stat comparison where it's passing grade, intermediate grade, deep grade that appears to be. I, I would think it's this year. It seems like it's closer to this year based on how high Wilson scored in all the categories. I don't think they factored in his 2019. I don't think they factored in some of the other years for Trevor Lawrence. So, you know, little grain of salt there. Um, now, for 2020 advanced stats, those were the ones where with adjusted completion percentage. Zach Wilson, 80.3%. Trevor Lawrence, 77.3%. Uh, so advantage Wilson. Average depth of target, Wilson was 10.9. Lawrence, 9 yards. Um, big time throw rate, Wilson, 8.6%. Uh, Trevor Lawrence, 7.1. So advantage Wilson. Turnover worthy plays, Wilson had 1% turnover worthy plays. Trevor Lawrence had 3.4% turnover worthy plays. Um, deep yards, Wilson, 1,286. Lawrence, 831. So uh, Wilson ranked third. Lawrence ranked 12th. Uh, Screen yards. Wilson had 318 screen yards. Trevor Lawrence had 686. That was the most in the country. He had the most screen yards. Um, Drop rate was 5.7 for Trevor Lawrence versus 4.7 for Zach Wilson. Uh, so drop rate Lawrence was affected more by drops than Wilson was. Um, but that said, even with that metric, he still had a higher, Wilson still had a higher adjusted completion percentage, um, in terms of pressure to sack conversion rate, which I really should look up. I don't actually know how that metric is sort of is good or bad. I guess pressure to sack, I guess when he's pressured, how many times does it turn into a sack? So Wilson was 13.9. Lawrence was 15.7, so I would assume that's probably worse. Uh, Average time to throw, so Wilson was 2.81 seconds, and then Lawrence was 2.35 seconds. That was sixth in the country. 
uh, which tells me his processing power is very, very fast. Um, or maybe his line is not as good and it forces him to throw the ball faster. So I, I don't know. Yeah. There's probably a little bit of uh, error. Like, I don't, I don't trust pro football focus for everything, but it's cool to see how they grade each guy on, like, a, a pseudo-level playing field. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's all interesting stuff. I mean, there are all kinds of variables that, that come into play. And, you know, it's funny. Like, you know, and I always say this about myself. I'm, I'm more of a concepts uh, guy. You know what I mean? Like, I believe – like, I'm really an intangible guy. I, I like all that stuff. I'm able to pick guys – that are that are going to be better um a little bit more so than i'm wrong you know like with in realistic terms like i just tend to be able to have an understanding of which types of players have a better shot um but like when we get into like analytics it's like the first tier of analytics i dig and then once we start going down these rabbit holes it loses me partially because just numbers in general. It's just, I don't think like that. It's just, I, I've always struggled once we get into like the, the numbers of something. Like I just, I can't stay with it. It's just a thing I have, but I will also say in my, from what I've seen the, when we start paying attention more to analytics, than football acumen and what somebody has been able to do on a football field and shit. I think that we end up errant more than we don't. And we've seen that with guys like Mike McCagden. You've seen it all over the place with these guys. It's like they, they take somebody because his metrics are better. But like you look at another guy on the football field, he's just better on the football field. But his metrics were, his measurables, let's say, weren't as good. So he slips, you know, those kinds of things. Now, as far as Trevor Lawrence, what I, you know, it, admittedly, last year I only saw like really like two games, and then I've been obviously doing research and all that shit. But last year, mm -hmm. um, the year before, I saw quite a few of his games, and let me tell you, man, what he's able to do on a football field is he he just ignites the whole team, like, and that's what like he comes out there and he takes over the game, and once that starts happening. He's almost unstoppable. And that's the kind of things that I like about him. And, you know, when you look at what do you have two losses or three losses his entire career in his lifetime, you know, people like to spin that. Well, he's not used to losing. And yeah, I get it. And that could be a negative, which is why he was crying at the Ohio state game and all that shit. But the truth is, is the guy has found a way to win at every single level uh, his entire life. And, you know, he's winning a championship his freshman year. He's playing with guys three, four years older than him. And, that's the kind of stuff that I like in a football player with Zach Wilson. You know what I see, like I said, I like a lot about him. Can't deny his arm strength, all those things. I like him. But for me, it's like, we're looking at a guy with two injuries who just sat comfortably behind a pocket and threw against guys that are going to be accountants. You know what I mean? Like that's, you know, we, you got to factor that in. Is it worth, is it too mm -hmm. much not to take him? I don't think so, but it's, you got to factor that stuff in. But once we get into these like comparison metrics, you know, it's like, I don't know, you got to look at situations and all that. I know PFF tries to do that, which is where mm -hmm. they kind of made their claim to fame, but I don't know mm -hmm. this stuff. It's, it loses me to a degree, you know? So Tom Coleman, I'll get to your comment in just a second. I want to touch on a few things uh, before we go into that. Uh, uh, Lloyd drops a super chat says we have to look at competition comparison. Lloyd, I completely agree that needs to be factored in as well. But I do think if you're going to play the comparison card with competition, you have to look at the skill level of the players that Wilson is playing with and the skill level of the players he's playing against as well. I think that is that is an important factor because it's hard to compare Trevor Lawrence with all these studs around him and Zach Wilson with like a great offensive line, but you know he's not really playing with many guys that are going to be on NFL teams. Um, so it's it's a little it's it's sort of t it's tough to make that comparison either way yeah. um and then i saw some guys saying what are fields's metrics so i decided to pull up fields metrics as well um so let's let's play a game i won't i won't read off the stats quite like that i won't go into like the analysis portion but let's do uh all right uh passing grade between wilson and fields who do you think was higher Passing grade? Well, it seems like you're setting me up for Wilson to do this, so I'm just going to go Wilson the whole time. 
That's what I feel like. So now. Wilson was a 95.5. <laughs> Fields was a 92.2. Uh, yeah. Intermediate passing grade. Who do you think had a better inter- intermediate grade? Intermediate, I would say Wilson. So it was actually Fields. Fields had a 94.5. Uh, Wilson had a 93.9. So, I mean, close, 0. 0.6 apart. Um, deep passing grade. Uh, I said before, Wilson was a 99.9. Fields was a 96.5. So, again, still really good, splitting hairs there. Uh, no pressure grade. Who do you think was better on that? No pressure grade? Um, yeah. I would, I would, I would think Wilson. That's what I would. Yeah. Think. So Wilson, Wilson was a 96.5. Uh, Fields was a 93.9. And then under pressure, who do you think was yeah. better? Fields. Fields was not. Fields got a 63.9. So out of Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, and Zach Wilson, Zach Wilson had the best grade under pressure. Um, adjusted Is completion a, percentage. Is there a metric there, like how many times? Like, if you're, what's the limit? What's the basis of the of the evaluation, though? Like, is it percentiles you know, if, among? So it's percentiles among quarterbacks with 150 plus dropbacks. But how many pressures did they say? Uh, you know what I mean. Not on the like page. On, had, it it it, it, it yeah, may have it might, something right? like that, but it might yeah. be something right. like. Fields played, what, eight games this year versus Wilson's, what do you have, 12? Yeah. So, you know, I, I think there's probably a more complete grade on Wilson as opposed to Fields because he had, like, the smaller sample size. Um, and then uh, adjusted completion percentage. Who do you think had a higher one? Adjusted completion percentage out of Fields. Fields and Wilson, uh, prob- yeah. Pro- yeah, probably uh, Fields. Yep. He had a higher one by 0.5%. So it was 80.3 to 80.8 mm. in favor of Fields. Uh, average depth of target. Who do you think threw the ball further down the field? Fields. Wilson, 10.9 versus 10.4. Uh, Big time throw rate. Who do you think had a higher percentage? Uh, Fields. Wilson, 8.6. Fields, 7.8. So Wilson wins that one, too. Uh, isn't it turnover, funny, like, like it's, it's weird, right? like 10 but like, But isn't it, now, though, like, when I look at 10.9 or 10.4, it's like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. The well, that's just it. That The, the average depth <laughs> of target is not – and yeah. it's also, like, I mean, maybe Wilson's is more impre- impressive because 10.9 yards, first 10 point – I mean, it's it's – 0.5 yards but he's also got you know f- at least four more i think he played in what 12 games this year i think or is that yeah, wrong? something like wrong. that it was 12 games this year um so he's got four more games on fields to be able to you know stretch it out a little bit it's it's on a percentage basis too but um yeah uh turnover worthy plays who do you think wins turnover worthy plays fields is has the more of them yeah he's got 2.3 percent wilson had one um deep yards it's going to be wilson because of the the amount of games wilson had 1286 fields had 709 i'm sure if you had four more games they're probably neck and neck yeah Um, right on i agree screen yards uh fields is better even if you were to extrapolate it out the four games. Uh, so Wilson had 318 screen yards, where Fields only had 86. I didn't realize it was that low. And Trevor that was, Lawrence had nice. 600? 600, yeah. He was the most in the country. He throws <laughs> a lot That's of it. screens. A lot of yeah, screens. Yeah, yeah. Um, drop rate. Uh, Fields had more dropped passes at 6% versus Fields' – or uh, versus – Sorry, Fields had 6% drop rate. Wilson had 4.7. Uh, pressure to sack conversion rate. This is where I get confused, but I think this is, I think the higher the number, the worse it is because the I guess based on pressure, how likely are you to take a sack? Um, Fields was 25% when he's under pressure, he's taken a sack versus Wilson's 13.9. So that that's way different than I thought it would have been. Yeah. 
Well, that's well, actually a shocking field one. Is gonna, yeah, field is going to run around back there longer. You know what I mean? But mm-hmm. then he, yeah, he takes off downfield a lot too. I find that interesting. That's a, that's surprising to me. Yeah, that that one definitely struck me as odd. The average time to throw. Uh, so Wilson was a two point eight one second time to throw. Trevor Lawrence was like two point was it three or something like that. It was a lot better. Fields three point one one. So a lot longer. He was 140th in the country in terms of average time to throw, which means he was able to, it may not be sitting in the pocket, but because of the style of play Fields tends to have, I think mm-hmm. he holds on to the ball longer, which is almost like the Russell Wilson, Deshaun Watson argument, where if you hold on to the ball too long, you're more likely to take a sack because you're trying to make that big play happen. And then you're also creating plays by holding on to the ball a little bit longer. So it's sort it's an odd stat. I don't really love the average time to throw it's i mean with wilson maybe it helps us a little bit kind of figure out his his protection um yeah again it's it's splitting hairs on a lot of this stuff but um some of these yeah, metrics people, i was a little surprised yeah and people get lost in these things too man you know what i mean like mm-hmm. and i'm not i'm not invalidating their worth like when you're when you're really trying to decide between one guy or another This is sometimes the stuff that separates too. You start looking at, you know, points of seconds and drills and, and, and all that sort of stuff. But for me, again, I think like, it always surprised me how much the ratings change after the season. Like when you were Mm -hmm. able to watch these guys on the field, there was a certain amount that they can accomplish. Then between that and the combine and then the combine to the draft, it's like people go from, the, the third guy overall to the fourth rounder and vice versa. Like I'm watching mm-hmm. Seth Williams, somebody that's been one of my sleepers out of Auburn. Um, I've been watching him these past two weeks get considered. He's all of a sudden like getting taken in the second round. He was a fourth to fifth round pick. And it's like, what happened? You know what I mean? Like, so, but this is the stuff people get, get, get into doing and they look deeper. Mm-hmm. And I think it can be valuable but I think when you start overvaluing this stuff versus, you know, over what's on the field, I think you can get into mm-hmm. some hot water. Um, yeah. So I prefer the on the field play. I don't, you know, combine's great. And I think this stuff's good. But again, mm-hmm. I just think the one is more valuable than the other. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't love the whole college um, grading system because of the, the, wild difference in level of competition and like skill of player in the NFL. There's a lot more parity across the league. So I, I think I value that a little bit more, but there's gotta be context with the numbers. Like you said, if you're watching the tape and you see like, okay, this person had a great game against this team. Well, why did they have a great game? Was the backup quarterback in for that game? And maybe this defensive player got two interceptions because the backup quarterback's throwing it. So that's inflating his grade more than saying having like a, you know, a Tom Brady or a, you know, insert whatever starting quarterback you want there. It's there's, there has to be context to the numbers and it's a little tough looking at it just from a numbers perspective. And I know Joe blew it. If he's watching this, he's probably losing his mind. He's like, I hate pro football focus, Ryan. What are you doing? He's going to chew me out for this. He's going to, he's going to be so mad. Um, Tom jumps in with a super chat. Tom, we're getting your, your your comment now. So he says, Jets player most likely to bounce back post Gase. What would you say, Green Bean? Uh, Sam Darnold. What do you think of that? That was a curveball, <laughs> huh? <laughs> that's a that is no, that's good. That's a that's a thinking outside the box, my friend. Yeah. Um, I, look, I I hope it's Chris Herndon. Um, yeah. But I actually think one of these running backs, I think that what he did to the running back stable last year was was borderline criminal, you know, running Mm -hmm. Frank Gore all day and all this stuff. So I think maybe like a Ty Johnson, Josh Adams, Michael P. Ryan, or Mm -hmm. maybe like the Vincent Smiths of the world. I think one of those guys can show that they have a little bit more than they were given credit for. And Mims, too. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I just said like eight guys. Um, That's right. I hate the (laughs) face. I, I would them. say the Sam Darnold one's a that's a curveball and a half. Uh, <laughs> so I guess tech, it's technically a Jets player, but I'm going to say Jets player this year, and I'm I'm with you on Herndon. Right. Herndon for me, 
I hope that's who it is because I really, really liked Herndon and his potential two years ago with his first year at Gase. Then he had the suspen- he had the suspension that year and then got hurt and then missed the rest of the year. And then last year was just a no-show and it was the most disappointing player in my book. Um, so I'll say Herndon on the offense. Let me mm. see if there's another one in mind. Maybe, maybe it's McGovern. Like maybe this offensive line system yeah, that they yeah, have, like, yeah, like I like good. McGovern. He was a top ten center, and like the fact that he came in and just like at least the first like eight weeks of the season or seven weeks of the season was just like a real like oh. dud, <laughs> and then he he, it he turned it around in, the second half. Yeah, it was indescribable. Like you're watching a guy who's a top ten center. He was a very very good above average guard before that, and he comes mm-hmm. over here and he's it's like he's never played football before. You know, like, mm-hmm. what is that? And so uh, I fully expect Connor McGovern to be a staple in this offensive line for the next few years. And this mm-hmm. year, everybody's going to see it. And that Joe Douglas found three starting offensive linemen last mm-hmm. year. Like, you know, you get those comments, Joe Douglas uh, promised Sam's mom that he would protect him. He brought in eight offensive linemen and found three starters last year. Like, what oh. else could you, you know what I mean? So hold I on, we got uh, O'Leary coming in. Let me see if I can oh, do the cool good. transition there switch. Let's see if I could do it. Can I do it? Can I do it? Can I do it? I see. I never know when it's gonna pop up. Up. Now. Up. Now. 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 He still didn't pop through. What the now? <laughs> it's like three, two, one. Now. <laughs> now. Go. All right, I'm gonna really try He's... now. Uh... Now. Now. <laughs> come on where is he he's, i just accepted him so he should be coming into the zoom thing in just a second and i can't i can't focus on anything until he pops in because i'm like way too dialed into the, to this come on o'leary i know you're there no this is like yeah. this will drive me banana. now now <laughs> come on <laughs> Look at all the O'Leary O'Leary. faces. The O'Leary's and the bananas are popping up now. Why can't he hop in? You'll have to, Green Bean, take a look at your phone because I don't know if if he's texting us. My phone's up on the (laughs) on the wall back there, so I don't I don't know if he's he may not be. Oh, there we go. Now, yeah, (laughs) (laughs) it's so great. (laughs) It's so good. All right, now he should pop up. He's gonna pop up in just a second. (laughs) Oh God. Oh, well, at least our panels are right. And I did this transition almost seamlessly. Oh, Maddie! Uh, Welcome! Yeah. Now! Am, now. I, am I in? You're in! There he is. Oh, You're finally. In. Jesus Christ. There he is. <laughs> I, I accepted you, and we're like watching, and we're like, okay, three, two, one, now. Yeah. Now. Now. Uh, what now. Happened? And I'm like waiting to do the transition, and then I'm like looking at Green Bean, and then you pop in, and I'm like, oh, I forgot it. <laughs> Damn it. Yeah, no. That was, um, yeah, hand up. That's on me, boys. Uh, I don't know why. It was just giving me the wheel of death for a while here, folks. Yeah, <laughs> the wheel of death. I had to come on and talk some Jets, man. I just, I'm like mentally exhausted. So I got myself a nice Trulies and said, I need to talk to my two Ooh. best Jets buddies. And uh, there you go. And get some takes. I love here. it. I'm, I'm ready to argue about uh, running back at 34, by the way. I've been doing that Ooh. on TikTok and Twitter all day long. So I'm like, I'm ready to go. I'll fight someone right now. What's he's, the argument? He's ready is it, and is fired it, up. Is the argument format like people are trying to justify doing it, or yeah. are you doing it? No, oh, I'm absolutely. Saying, I know O'Leary's not on board with yeah. running back. I, I said, didn't no. know if we changed this tune. You know? you're, no, you're. I said you're a silly goose. You, you, the Jets can't take a running back that early. Come on now, they need a cornerback and an offensive lineman. Before yeah. we get into yeah. the, the 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 running back conversation at 34, I got two things. So. First off, if you guys want your shot to win a shirt at the end of this stream, there is a pinned comment in the live stream, uh, in the in the chat. All you have to do is go to that tweet. You have to retweet it, tag Matt, myself, and Green Bean, and follow Sack Exchange. You follow this tweet or retweet it, and you'll get yourself entered to win a shirt at the end of this stream. Sack Exchange absolutely deserves the follow. This guy has been nothing but in an incredibly generous and genuine jet fan that is all about helping out everyone across the spectrum and he deserves a follow at the very least 
But if you want to win something cool, uh, throw a retweet in there and tag us in it to get entered. Uh, secondly, Matt, you're having a truly. Do you drink White Claws at all? Love them. Oh, I love White Claws. So I actually, Becca went to the store the other day, and I've known for a while they've had the two different variety packs. Mm-hmm. They have a third one now. I don't know if you know this. Uh, I'm intrigued. Go, go on. Uh, I'm, I love this sort of stuff. So the, the first variety pack, you know, is the, uh, you pro- do you know the first two? Like the ones where yeah, it's, so it's like tangerine, lemon, mango, um, mango, yeah. there's lime, black, black cherry, black all, all that good stuff. Grapefruit. Yeah. 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 So the third one is pretty cool. The third one's got raspberry. It's got mango in it again. They, I think mango's in all three of them for some reason. Mango's, um, by the way, I'm anti-mango. I, I'm not anti-mango. I'm just, it's not like the first one I go for. I actually like the black cherry a lot. Uh, black blackberry, I believe, is in it. Oh, okay. Yes. I did oh, have and pineapple. And pineapple. pineapple. I can give you a review on them. Um, mm-hmm. what, pineapple, not, okay. Uh, raspberry, not good. What were the other ones you said? Mango. You're not a mango guy. Mango, and the other one was blackberry, I believe. Blackberry, I good. So I don't know if you I knew I like that. blackberry. My... My girlfriend's an accountant, so she loves Excel sheets. So last mm-hmm. year, <laughs> we started an Excel spreadsheet, and we've been taste yeah, yeah. testing every single flavor and every brand. Um, mm-hmm. So we have a huge, long-running thing. So we just got the third variety pack this past weekend. So I literally I just had those that you listed off. I get there's too many different brands and stuff, so that's why I was asking like what's in it. Um, but sure. yes, I have had them. Uh, the Pineapple did not score very high. That was coming in at like a three-two mm-hmm. for me. Okay. Um, okay. Black, the blackberry, right? Or mm-hmm. yeah, the blackberry yep. is much much higher up. Raspberry, eh, a, a little underwhelming to be honest with you. I liked a lot of them. I felt like the pineapple one could have been good mixed with something else because it was very like sweet and and pina colada, colada e colo- co- tasted like a pina colada. <laughs> yeah, I got uh, those. Books. Now let me let let me ask you this, Matt. Sure. Where? Did you rank Kalo on that? Kalo's or is it not on it? Uh, did not make the list because I feel like that's its own separate category. Because now we can't. That's fair. I feel like we can't cross contaminate our hemp and our alcohol. I feel like we have to have. But those. you know what we can do? Next week, boys and girls, you know what Tuesday is? It's Green Day! <laughs> 420, boys! Oh yeah. Oh Sorry. okay. Oh, it's a it's a New York's legal, Jersey's legal. Bong rip there Tuesdays. No, sorry, <laughs> I can't do that. Oh god, I wouldn't get anything done. I'd be all scatterbrained. Um, okay. Sorry. Let's let's get back on track a little bit. Um, huh. so Tom had asked Green Bean and I, Jets player most likely to bounce back post Gase. We gave our answers. Uh, Green Bean actually said Sam Darnold to start. <laughs> And I was like, wow, that's that's clever. So so then he switched it to Herndon. And yeah. then I, I agreed with Herndon. And then I, I seconded, or I guess the, the next player that I went in with was McGovern. I thought maybe the offensive system might let it like lead towards uh, higher quality play that we were used to when we signed him. We signed him as a top 10 center. We got like not top 10 center until like the last seven games or so. Um, I don't know. I like it's probably it. hit or miss. What, what would you say? Can I go instead of bounce back? Can I do breakout instead, like a breakout year? Mm-hmm. Uh, Ty Johnson would be my answer because yeah, I think well, that good. he flashed a little bit mm-hmm. with Gate, but then I think in this wide zone offense that they're gonna run, I think he's gonna he, he's gonna lead the team in rushing this year. I am I'm confident yeah. in saying that it's not gonna be Coleman. It's not it definitely it's not gonna be Michael P Ryan. And I don't think it's going to be the running back they draft this year. I am confident in saying that Ty Johnson will lead the team in rushing yards this year. Ooh, I like that. I I would be really, really excited because I I liked what I saw out of him last year. He had that what? Like, was he our only 100-yard rusher last year? I think he was. Against the Raiders, right? I think so, yeah. (laughs) I'm pretty sure that was the week. Uh, Gang Green jumps in, says, You're Mike LaFleur, the OC. How would you help Wilson be successful would you run the ball more? Would you pass the ball more or design runs for him? If I was Mike LaFleur, and I don't know if he's going to do this or not, but what I would do is I would implement a heck ton of RPOs because it keeps the defense off balance. 
I don't want my quarterback running a whole lot, so maybe that kind of tips your hand a little bit, but he does have enough wheels where he could, you know, tuck the ball and run. Uh, but then it gives you the option to run the ball with your running back or pass it, and it kind of, I think it gives him a little bit more um, flexibility in terms of that. I think play action is probably, if I had to give more of a, a concrete answer, I think the play action, if we could set that up, if we're able to run successfully and set up the play action, he seems like he excels at that. Uh, Greenbean, what would you say you would do if you were Mike LaFleur and you were calling an offense for Zach Wilson? I would run him in the A gap all day. That's what I would do. <laughs> With the 37-year-old running back, right? That's it. Him and Frank Gore holding hands, running through the A gap. Um, yeah, you know what's funny? I got a comment this week. It said, "How the hell are the New York Jets not known for the jet sweep? Like, how do we? Like, we're one of the only franchises who don't use it. Like, we'll run one, you know, every eight games. You know what I mean? It's like, what is this?" So I'd love to see some RPOs. Again, I think that Zach Wilson, if we take Zach Wilson, our priority has to be keeping him in the damn pocket, untouched, uh, and give him a give him the time he needs to to get to you know survey the field, read the defense, and get to his uh, his open receiver. I think we're going to have lots of them this year. I think mm -hmm. our receivers are going to be give, they're going to gain the space, and I think uh, I would just try to see if he's a pocket passer and just slice the defense apart. That's what I'd try to see first. Matt, what about you? What do you want to see Mike LaFleur call this year? Um, I want him to keep it simple. Um, yeah. And I know that's kind of lame because we've been talking about, oh, you know, Zach Wilson, all the arm talent he has and stuff like that. I want him to make life as easy as possible for Zach in year one, meaning scheming right. guys open, something that Adam Gase – did terribly his route tree like the routes that he would call on his plays he'd end up have a, like three guys end up in the same spot it was ridiculous it was mm -hmm. awful so we need to make easy completions get him in a rhythm and then as you said ryan do the things that he's good at rpos read options mix those in obviously you don't want to get the guy killed but that's one of his strengths so i would tend to use that and he's very good outside the pocket so designed rollouts like something they didn't do enough with Sam Darnold, who is probably a better passer on the run than in the pocket. So I think with Wilson, a lot of play action, a lot of rollouts when needed, and just easy gimme completions to get the confidence up. I like what Rafa said in the chat just now. He said, what about no huddle? And I don't know if, if Wilson is, is adept at the no huddle or not, but it seemed like it was something that Sam thrived in, and it's just something we never touched on. Never. Like, keep the defense on the field. Let him know, like, okay, this is, you know, it, who knows? Maybe If there's a, uh, a cornerback out on the field that he knows is a, a more of a liability, why not run the, the no huddle? Try to get the mismatch you want. To get, give us a little bit of motion. I think, like Matt said, making it easier and having – and part of that is having that motion, having that no huddle, where you can diagnose plays a little bit more. You, you, you call two, three plays before you know you know you're running no huddle, and then everyone's on the same page. You could just be like, okay, yo, play 34. Like, check it out on your wrist. Um, so I like that a lot. Greenbean, it, it sounded like you wanted to say something and add on to that. I forgot what we were talking about. So what did Rafa <laughs> say? <laughs> he was just talking about how uh, we should incorporate the no huddle. Oh, yeah, man. You know, I know what I was going to say was, yes, like you you had mentioned the comment that it, uh, it was Sam Darnold ran a few times and it looked like it was working, so we didn't do it. And my whole point was just going to be, yeah, I mean, as soon as we find anything that works, like you run Ty Johnson, you know, when uh, Frank Gord gets hurt, you run Ty Johnson and, and Josh Adams and they get the most yards of a jet all year. All, all year. Next week, mm -hmm. back to Frank Gore. So I'd like to see something a little bit creative, but I do agree with what Matt said. And that's kind of what I was alluding to. It's like my, my priority this year would be to acclimate Zach Wilson to the NFL game. So protect him and start simple with, with throws and reads that he's comfortable with. Um, and if, if we could factor in the no huddle, that would be great. I just don't know if coming out of the gate, you know, a young guy from BYU coming into the NFL, 
running a no huddle. I just feel like, you know, it's a recipe, man. Let's, let's, let's roll before we, what would be the term there? Roll before we walk roll. before we run. <laughs> Yeah, I was. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's, that's I wanted, yeah. I, I see I what you were trying to, to do. Say roll. Yeah, <laughs> that's all right. It, yeah, it's like it, every night. It all made it all made sense to me. <laughs> uh, what else do I got in here? Dimitri comes in with a super chat. Says, "Is Wilson a lot more mobile than Darnold? Is he as mobile as Josh Allen?" Um, I would say somewhere around Sam's mobility. Um, I would not put him in the Josh Allen category just because Josh Allen feels more like a Cam Newton, like just a really big body guy that's going to bulldoze over you. I don't want Zach Wilson running a whole lot because he's not that heavy. He's 210, I think, is what they weighed him in at. Um, so I don't ideally want to see that. I'm hoping he slides more. <laughs> um, so I would say on par with Sam Darnold. Greenbean, what about you? Where would you put Wilson's uh, running ability? Um, yeah, I don't know. It looks like he could do it. I, I think Sam is an under, uh, I think his running ability is underappreciated. I think it's a little bit better than he was given credit for. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't view Wilson. That's not the money for me. I, I want, I really want this guy to be behind a nice, comfortable pocket. That's what I see. You know, some design rollouts and things like that. But I think, uh, I would just say, I don't view him as a running quarterback mobile but I don't view I don't I wouldn't like to see him running. What about you, Matt? What do you think of Wilson's mobility? Yeah, I I, I think it's good, like good enough for for today's NFL for sure. I would say probably slightly better than Sam, but I do agree with Greenbean. Uh, his running ab- Sam's that is running ability has been underrated because Gase turned him into a statue. He tried to make him Peyton Manning, which he's not. Um, but I would say that Wilson's is slightly better. It's not anywhere close to the level of Josh Allen. Uh, Allen is a, a special talent because of that. Uh, but I would say probably somewhere in between and, you know, more like, I don't know, like Russell Wilson, maybe a fair comparison, or does he even maybe run a little bit too much? I would say Wilson feels more, I, not that he's a runner, but he feels faster than Wilson like I I think Wilson with like a with Sam I feel like is close ish maybe like I don't consider Sam a runner I think he's good on the run and mobile why I don't know it's tough to see because like Sam I felt like he was under duress his entire college career and Mm -hmm. his entire pro career so we got to see a lot of that where Wilson's offensive line was so good you didn't have to see that much of it I do think Wilson's really good at the play action though I have yeah, really I have. enjoyed watching him. Totally. I think that's where he's going to shine. Uh, Scott jumps in with Super Chat, says, We're not winning next year. Only thing that matters is we justify our number two pick. Go offense at 23 and 34, interior offensive line maybe, and Fryermuth at 34. So I know Green Bean's excited. Yeah! About that. <laughs> we were talking about this earlier, and I'm – I could get on board. If if the whole goal of this season was to support Zach Wilson, forget the rest of the team. Let's let's focus on the, the, the primary guy. Like let's let's make this work the way we didn't make it work with Sam or Gino or Sanchez or any of those guys. So if they decide Creed Humphrey twenty three, Wyatt Davis thirty four, wide receiver in the third round, and they just go all out on the offensive side of the ball, and they just say, hey, we're going to punt on cornerback and edge rusher, even though they're big needs for this team, but we got two first-round picks next year. Um, I could understand that. I don't think that's the way they're going to go, but I would I would understand it, and I could, I could see us valuing that um, style of drafting because of how former quarterbacks of ours have turned out. So Matt, I'll throw it to you first. What do you think of uh, going offense at 23 and 34? Do you think we should do it because we're drafting a quarterback at two? uh, Or are you more of the mindset of drafting a better player at possibly a premier position? This is a very good question. And I think you can make reasonable cases on both sides. And here's Mm -hmm. what I will say. Um, the only way I think I go offense back to back is if you're doing back to back offensive linemen. 
then I would say, okay, yes. There is so, to me, there is not something that I value enough at 34 where I would say, okay, I'm okay with, with taking player there. Firemuth, I like him. I do. But with the amount of needs on this Jets team, I couldn't wrap my brain around taking Firemuth if Greg Newsom the second is sitting there. Same with a wide receiver. I like the Jets wide receiving core. I think they need to add a mid-round wide receiver, like maybe a Nico Collins in the third round. That's someone I like a lot. He's a, a deep ball kind of a guy, an, another big body, but can go up and get the ball. To me, I think the two positions you need to attack at 23 and 34 are interior offensive line and corner. And I think whichever one of those two you take at 23, you take the other at 34. Uh, I think people are sleeping on a little bit too much the need at corner right now. Because as of like this second, obviously they could change if they go out and sign a Richard Sherman. But yeah, Bryce Hall on the outside, who I like. Bless Austin, which is a little scary on the outside. And Javelin Gidry in the slot. That is not nearly enough in today's passing league. So I definitely think you have to address that position. And at at either 23 or 34, I think it's an outside corner. So that's kind of my stance on it. Yeah, that's exactly where I went in my most recent mock draft. And I had us going with Caleb Farley, the cornerback from Virginia or Virginia Tech at uh, 23. And my rationale for that, uh, and I'll, I'll get to Green Bean's thoughts on, on this in, in just a second, but the the idea was, okay, if Quiddy Pay. JC Horn and Elijah Vera Tucker are gone. Where do we go at 23? And my, my thoughts were like, okay, I understand Creed Humphrey, but it feels like they want to run it back with McGovern. So like, are they going to make that pick? I'm not so sure. So I opted with the corner and I was actually looking at Greg Newsom and I was looking at Farley because of Farley's uh, back surgery. And then I came across, I didn't realize this, but Newsom has never started a full season <laughs> in college. So I was like, well, wait a second. Like that doesn't, you know, make any sense from a, you know, an injury perspective, but I think the like value wise him at either one of those guys at 23 or 34 hold a lot more value than potentially reaching on a player just to fill a need at an offensive line spot. Um, so I'm with you, Matt. I think for me, cornerback at 23 to get that fifth year option is really attractive. I like that. Um, who you, who you like, I think, is is flavor of the week type stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Green Bean, your thoughts on going offense at 23 and 34 after drafting a quarterback at number two? Well, you know, and like I mentioned this earlier. I think a lot of people weren't here yet when I talked about this. But um, I think the logic there, and like Matt said, there are really good, valid arguments for both schools of thought. Like, I can totally get comfortable residing in either side of it. I can go, absolutely, I think this is sound. And then you go to the other side, I could say it's sound. So those two sides are, one is just get the offensive line done, use your premium picks, uh, the highest picks you have on the best possible and available offensive linemen in this draft, particularly in the interior, I get it. The other logic is the, the offensive line is actually the deepest positional group outside of quarterback. This is a particularly strong quarterback draft. But then right following that is offensive line. So, uh, you know, considering that, knowing that you're going to be able to get a really starting caliber offensive line at either 34, 66, or 86, if you have that cornerback that you like and it's kind of the end of your top tier or second tier of cornerbacks at 23 or 34, it, there really is a, a very strong case to be made for grabbing him there the next one offensive lineman and then and then uh you know grabbing another one in the third kind of a thing so i think um when when you look at the cornerbacks on this team and you know i've said this a whole bunch and i know a lot of people feel the same way i i like that we're putting forth an, an effort to mask the cornerbacks with an actual edge rush like we have been going backwards outside in for far too long trying to get cornerbacks with no edge rush and you know, any a receiver is going to ultimately lose a cornerback. It, any, anybody but Revis is going to be lost if they're running around, if the quarterback has that much time, right? 
So I think the fact that we actually did pay some attention to the edge rush this year, and don't forget, we have guys like like Bryce Huff and Jabari Zuniga, who we didn't see last year, and he was very good. Zuniga, that is, was good in college. I liked him a whole bunch coming out. Um, and the injuries and everything like that. So we still have those guys. John Franklin Myers, we brought in Vinny Curry. We, were, we, we, we brought in uh, Carl Lawson. So I think there really is a case to be made for cornerback because we need an outside cornerback and we need a nickel. So at some point, you got to get somebody in here, man. Um, but if you just want to get the offensive line done, there's a case for that too. I'd probably – mix it up a little bit i think but uh yeah i don't know that's my thoughts i think that's fair uh jordan ellerston ellertson i see what you did there he dropped a four dollar and 20 cent donation <laughs> <laughs> i like the way you think my friend uh add jalen phillips to this line pass rush city um yeah, look, we were talking about Jalen Phillips. I think when we did our mock draft over on Green Beans channel, Matt, were you the one that took Jalen Phillips? Yes, at 34. Mm -hmm. I I could understand that. And I think, Green Bean, you were starting to talk a little bit about Jalen Phillips' story, right? You, you were saying you were starting yeah. to fall a little bit more for him. Could you explain a little bit more about it? I don't know a ton about him. I've only seen some of his highlights. Yeah, well, there was the um... – there, there's a documentary like a, a lot of people like when they talk about Jalen Phillips one of the concerns is the the concussions the injury issue with him right but if you watch like just looking at that on, on the service yeah it, it's a concern it, it's always going to be a concern but when you there's this documentary that I watched on YouTube and anybody can watch it you just you know Jalen Phillips documentary and you'll see it and it really highlights his particular struggle and, and what happened and how he worked to get past it. And you can't help but, but root for a guy like that. Now, when he, this going into 2020 with all the opt-outs and everything, he kind of had to just, you know, to come in and replace a prolific player in Rousseau. So, and he did that. So it's just like his whole story and everything that led to him being one of the top edge rushers in the draft, they have, um, really it's worked on me. Like I like the pedigree. I like who this person is. I like his makeup, his work ethic. In, in addition to his skills and his body, you know, his build and everything, very athletic. So yeah, anybody, if anybody's interested, I think it's like a 30, 40 minute documentary. It's really worth your time to try to get to know this prospect. I think you'll enjoy it. I like it. I like it. Matt, anything to add about Jalen Phillips? I, I really like him as a prospect a lot. Um, it depends on how the board falls. In, in that green bean mock, it was kind of just I didn't love any of the value at corner at that spot, and he was just sitting there in the second round. I, like, I, I love the potential with this kid. Um, so I went that direction. So it really depends who's on the board for me if I'm taking him, but I think there's a legitimate chance that he has the most talent in from a pass rusher perspective in this draft class. Uh, there is just a little bit of an injury concern, uh, so which is why he's dropping in the later first to the early second in that range. But, mm -hmm. I mean, that would be absolutely insane if you could have him learn from Vinny Curry for a year and then take over on the other side with Carl Lawson. That's special. Yeah. It would be fun. I love, like Green Bean said earlier, the fact that we're building from a pass rush and then going out, like the, the fact that we haven't, like, addressed corner, like, in free agency leads me to believe they want to dominate with that front four. And I think Carl Lawson, I think Carl Lawson, then you have Vinnie Curry kind of back up Lawson and come in and sit situational pass rush downs. And then Zuniga, I think goes on the other side. Yeah. And I feel like, like he has pass rush ability, but he doesn't, he strikes me more of like the, this is probably a bad comparison, but like if Carl Lawson is the John Abraham, I feel like Zuniga could be trying to play the Brian Thomas type role, um, where it's not the you know elite edge rusher, but he's going to play contain. He's you know good against the run, that sort of thing. Uh, so we'll see how that all plays out. Steven drops in with a super chat, says Matt will hate this, but do not be shocked if we if you see Travis Etienne drafted. Thanks guys for the support. Steven, this is our buddy, Sack Exchange. I know that name. 
<laughs> I've seen it in there. There is a link at the top of the live stream. Green Beans comment. I, 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 uh, I pinned it in the top of the live stream. All you have to go is do is go. Uh, blah, 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 words. All you have to do is go to that tweet, mm -hmm. follow Sack Exchange, and then tag Green Bean, Matt, and myself. We're going to raffle off a shirt at the end of this stream. Uh, so make sure you do that, and you will get entered to win a shirt at the end of the uh, at the end of the show. Um, so Matt, I want to get your thoughts on uh, Stephen's comment. He says he could see us drafting Travis Etienne. What do you think? I would be genuinely stunned if Joe Douglas decided to do that, based on everything we've seen for a year. And what is it? It's coming up, coming up on two years actually uh, with Joe Douglas yep. in here. I would be really, really surprised if he spent a premium asset to draft Travis Etienne. Again, I really I want to make it clear. I like Etienne and Najee Harris in yeah. a vacuum as prospects. I just don't think that it would be wise for the Jets to use that high of a pick on a player like that when they have so many other needs, specifically on the offensive line. Yeah, Green Bean, your thoughts on Etienne possibly coming to the Jets? Um, I think that if they were going to do it, I, I really think Najee would have the nod over Etienne. That's my thoughts. And Najee Harris is one of my favorite players in the entire draft. I mean, I am in love with how this guy plays the game of football and all those crazy workout tapes that are coming out. I mean, watching him work out, it makes me want to punch somebody. That's my, I'm like, yeah, it gets me pumped. Not pumped enough to go into the gym, but pumped enough to feel pumped. Um, but yeah, so, but I don't, but I agree with Matt, I just don't see it, man. Like, again, like when you look at what we're really talking about here, uh, Joe Douglas's teams that he's worked for have never taken a running back higher than the fourth round. The, the San Francisco 49ers where most of our coaching staff comes from, they don't take running backs in the early rounds. Like they, they they're, they're able to take guys like Mostert an undrafted free agent and make him into a star. The Shanahan offense has been doing that way back since Terrell Davis, man. Um, that's what they do. They they take these guys that that aren't, you know, premier running backs, and the system is good enough to get them uh, to look like premier running backs. So I just think the odds are stacked against taking a running back that early, especially when we have this many holes. So I know Steve said don't be shocked. And should maybe shocked is a strong word, but I would be genuinely surprised if that happened. Yeah, I don't think we go running back. I would say before the fourth round, I would be really surprised. I, I think just like you guys said, I'm going to echo the same sentiment. And it's we have so many holes, and based on the style of offense we're projected to run, it seems like we're going to be more of a running back by committee, and why waste a high-value asset in a draft pick? Uh, on doing that when you have guys that you just drafted last year in P. Ryan, you got Ty Johnson coming back, you brought in Tevin Coleman. It just seems like it's a crowded room right now for a higher draft pick uh, to come in. Yeah. Steven drops another super chat, says, By the way, Ryan, that Mangold jersey is fire. Check it out, boys. <laughs> oh. yeah, look at that. Thing. I like it. I like it. So that's my favorite that's jersey. Steve. This is from, Steve. from Steve. Steve sent this to me. Yes. Awesome dude. And I am so grateful. I literally, I've been looking for a man gold Jersey for the longest time. And this dude comes through and he goes, Ryan, I got you. I was like, Oh man. <laughs> oh man. This is yeah. so exciting. So I have all sorts of, I'm, I'm giddy. I'm like a little school girl right now. Um, <laughs> so thank you, Steven, for that. Uh, Mumtaz jumps in with super chat says guards are thin in draft and even best ones are iffy. Are there any tackles we can target that can shift to guard? Also, we need a tight end more than a wide receiver. Hmm. I don't, yeah. I don't know if I would necessarily agree with all that. There's, I don't think the guards are weak. I think it's deep. I don't, maybe it's not top heavy, if, if that's really like the way we want to go about it um are there tackles that can kick into guard there might be i don't know enough about them to, to actually make that call so i i have to pass that off a little bit uh as far as you think we need a tight end more than a wide receiver in the immediate future i guess because we have a pretty solid four uh four pack of receivers you got Keelan Cole, Jamison Crowder, Corey Davis, Denzel Mims. Um, 
I like the way that looks, but you got Keelan Cole on a one-year contract. You got Jamison Crowder on a one-year contract. Herndon's going into the last year of his contract. So it's kind of like a, I'd rather see what we have in Herndon before we waste a higher asset on that. And then, I don't know. Like, I, I feel like Cole is not going to be here long-term. And, and Crowder, the same way. I think Crowder, this is probably Crowder's last year with us. Not that it's like, not that I don't like him. I just think, you know, he's getting up there a little bit in age. And I think there's probably someone on the roster that might be able to replace some of the yardage, maybe not all of it. Um, I don't know. It's interesting. I, I, I don't think the guards are thin. I'll say that. Definitely, if we're talking about weight, a lot of these guys are 330. <laughs> so sorry, yeah. Montez, not thin. Uh, and then uh, tight end, more the wide receiver. It, it's, I don't know, it's probably splitting here. It depends how you feel on Herndon. If you like Herndon and you want to see him do well, then you're probably not high on tight end. If you don't believe in Herndon, then yes, I absolutely see the need for tight end because I think Herndon, the last two years, hasn't shown us anything. So, uh, yeah. Greenbean, I'll throw, it, I'll throw it to you first. What do you think about the guards? Can any tackles kick into guard? And do you think we need a tight end more than a wide receiver? Uh, well, number one, the guards are not thin. I think the, per, the the tackles are really the strength of the class as far as the O-line goes. But the guard, I would not label this a thin uh, guard class by any means. I mean, there are quite a few. As far as tackles that can kick in, there there are some. You know, Robert Hainsey. Uh, is 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 one there's a few more you know there's there's a few other guys but the interesting thing about a lot of these tackles is that it's a particularly athletic class so um a little bit more so than usual i mean you have the big beefcakes and 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 all that too but there's a lot of guys that have that athleticism similar to what we saw last year with you know tristan Wirfs running a four eight and is like fucking 38 inch vertical whatever it was and and uh, Makai Becton at 370 running a 5'11". Like they were, they, that was an athletic bunch, uh, you know, Wills as well. So this is kind of in that same mold. So I wouldn't say that it's a weak or thin was the word he used, guard class. There are quite a few. I think that are plug and play all the way to the third round. You're going to have guys that could conceivably start uh, year one. As far as needing a tight end over a wide receiver, I actually agree with that. I think that our wide receiver core is 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 really, um, I mean, it's all kind of unproven, but I think the potential is really uh, more so than we've had since 2010. You know, Corey Davis is a, is a stud. Denzel Mims, I, I just, it bothers me that the half the fan base seems to think that this is a throwaway guy. This is a first round pick. You know, I know he didn't, he didn't get picked in the first round, but he was he had a first round grade last year. All he did for us last year was catch, um, you know, yards after the catch and block his ass off. I don't know what it is that people are seeing that they don't like with Mims. I think he's an absolute stud. So then you throw in Keelan Cole and Jameson Crowder. As far as the tight ends, we brought in Tyler Croft. He's known as a very good blocker. That's great. We have Trevon Wesco, known as a great blocker. That's great. But he might even move to fullback slash H-back kind of a role. And then Chris Herndon. I mean, I hope for Chris Chris Herndon as much as anyone. But if you look at the actual truth of it, is he, he has never done very much. And when he did do something, um, it was, you know, going on three years ago. So I think that, you know, the Jets' last three tight ends that we picked were two fourth-rounders and a sixth-rounder, and I think it's probably high time that we put a little assets into this position because it's a very important position, especially for a team that's going to be running a lot of 12 personnel, which is two tight end sets. You want your blocker, and you want a guy who's versatile um, and a prolific pass catcher, and I think there are quite a few of them. So I would second that. I think tight end is, is the need, yeah. To your point as well, you're coming from an, uh, a 49ers offense that just had Kittle. So, you know, you may yeah. want to get your version of Kittle in this draft. So I can I can understand if they don't like Herndon, we will be drafting a tight end. I, we will know exactly how they feel about Herndon on draft uh, yeah, night, I think. Point. <laughs> uh, Matt, your thoughts on the guard class and then needing a tight end over a wide receiver? I like the guards. Uh, you guys mentioned the, uh, some of the bigger names, and I agree with Green Bean. I think you could find guys who could start into the third round. Uh, I also think uh, looking at a tackle like Alex Leatherwood, I think he's someone who can move inside and play guard. 
He's a little bit on the bigger side. Still athletic, but I think just a little bit on the bigger side and might transition to guard at the next level. Um, I still li- I like Herndon. I think he could be good. Uh, still be good, and he is someone I would absolutely pick to be on Gase Freedom Watch this year. I do like a tight end as a a deep sleeper, and I want to know if if Greenbean knows anything about this guy, Peyton Hendershot, in the later rounds from Indiana. He's six four two fifty, little an athletic tight end who was good in the red zone for them last year. Um, I, I know it's not as you know sexy as the the Kyle Pitts or Pratt Fryermuths and stuff like that, but if you're looking some for someone in like the fifth or sixth round. I'd be willing to take a swing on that with the athletic upside, pair him with Herndon. Hopefully one of the two of them work out and have the blocking tight end that you just picked up uh, in free agency. What was his name? Hendershot? Yeah, Peyton Hendershot. Okay, I'm going to look at him. I'm going to look at directly via your recommendation. I will learn more about Hendershot by the end of this night than I know I- about anyone else. As the tight end man himself, I figured I'd have to run that name by you. And if you didn't know, I, I think you would. Knowing you, I think you will fall in love with me. I feel like right, that's like awesome. more I'm than excited. any of us. Greenbean has been like pumping tight end this entire <laughs> off season. He's loved it. Yeah. No, it's a good thing, dude. You were de- you were spot it, on with Bryce Hall last year. You you were pumping Bryce Hall for a while, and then when we got oh, to yeah. draft night, it was like, okay, we I think all of us had him in the third round. And the fact that we got him in the fifth round was like, we were pumped. Yeah. Well, you know what's funny? Speaking of Bryce Hall, I actually went to Scott Stadium, the UVA uh, stadium just today and filmed a few videos. And uh, there was one place called Bryant Hall. And I made a little video for Instagram. So this should be named Bryce Hall. There you go. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was just there today, man. So that's cool you mentioned him. And I'm all psyched up about some UVA guys. But yeah, man, I think uh, tight ends are are. On- undervalued and i wouldn't put them over receivers or offensive line or anything like that but i think once you have a few pieces if you could really have an effective tight end somebody who can help with blocking and also be a a reliable outlet that can get some yards after the catch i mean it changes everything look at all the great teams that have had good tight ends from the dallas cowboys to you know antonio gates tony gonzalez when you have that guy it's it's uh, it's, it's worlds different you know J Ruck Entertainment Music and Media drops in with a super chat. He says, Watson issues over by draft. We trade number two and next year's. Not happening. Zero shot. I'm a big Watson. Like, you know, I was all for trading for him. I know Greenbean was saying he's going to be our quarterback at the start of the season, and all of us were on board, and then all this stuff started popping up, and it's all going sideways. And one, it's definitely not going to be resolved by the draft. And two, uh, there is zero shot the Jets with the number two overall pick decide to give up a ton of assets, which was already a long shot for Douglas to do. Like, the only way Douglas does this is if he's not confident in Wilson, Fields, Lance, and Watson's resume is spotless, and he's just like, I want to be there. That's the that's the whole thing. So zero shot Watson comes to New York at this point. Um, yeah, that's... I don't know. Green bean, any, any thoughts on that? All right. Um, any thoughts on what? I'm sorry. That's I okay. I tried, uh, I tried to hear it. I know you, you, I should, I see it's my fault. I should have, I, I asked you to focus on the chat and then I wind up like lobby. Hey, Greenby, what do you think of this? I like totally Is like did Watson? not prep you for the, yeah, it's a Watson thing. Yeah. Tra- right. Trading the number think... two pick for Watson. If everything's yeah, clear. It's funny. It's funny because I was listening to you while I did that, but when you asked me, I lost it. But so I think you're you're very accurate in saying like for Joe Douglas to be considering this move, I think he's like an all in kind of guy. If he wants to get it done, he'll get it done. But that was already outside of what we've seen from him already. He's a guy trading assets away, you know, trading um, known commodities away for assets, you know. So. I think that he was into it, but once you get something like this, nobody saw this coming. I mean, Deshaun Watson has been an upstanding citizen by all measurements that we were aware of up until all of a sudden. So I think uh, that ship has sailed. Now he sees they can get 
you know, Zach Wilson and use 23 in next year's first and all that sort of stuff. So I don't see it. Now, if they came back and said, hey, give us a fifth and I'll throw you to Sean Watson, maybe. But I think you just, it's too much. You don't want this. So I think that ship has sailed, unfortunately. Matt, what are you thinking about uh, the issues with Watson? And if they're over by the draft, you giving up number two plus whatever next year's, uh, you know, whatever? No, I think we got to wait this out still at this point. There's two of the, like, 22 names have been, you know, have came out so far. So I think there's going to be a little bit of, of a while here. Um, obviously, we'll see what happens in the, uh, like, the lawsuits and stuff like that. But I don't expect the New York Jets to be in on him at this point. And, you know, we'll, we'll see what his future holds. Um, obviously, the uh, what's going to come out of this is going to be huge for him like the both yeah in the nfl and like life terms yeah i mean i think there's no shot in hell he's playing this year i think he'll go on the nfl's commissioner like exempt list or whatever for a season they'll they'll put him on ice until things uh get figured out legally and then there, i mean if you've seen any of like the i don't know if it's testimony or if it's just like the the witnesses or the the girls speaking out i mean this seems like this is like really turning bad when you start losing all your sponsors like they what was it like nike dropped them and like uh beats by dre and like a couple of them put them on like a pause i think beats by mm -hmm. dre definitely cut ties i think some of them were just like a a pause kind of deal i'd have to go back and see which brands yeah i think they probably hopped it's like a waterfall like once one hops off then it's like oh we can't be the one associated with them and it's like boom 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 boom, boom and you lose everything yeah. right off the bat i mean there's a there's a oh. shot that it like really goes bad for Watson and like all that equity that he built up of being like a great person and a great player in, in Houston, just like straight down the toilet real quick. Um, I don't know. It's going to be interesting. I don't think the jets are in on this, whether it's this year or next year, it's, it's not happening uh, based on everything we're seeing. The NY bully. Thank you so much for the super chat says, I think people are sleeping on Zach Wilson's athleticism. Athletically, I think he's Aaron Rodgers, Alex Smith, before the injury. I compare his arm talent to somewhat of a Russell Wilson thoughts. Um, hmm. Athletically, like Aaron Rodgers or Alex Smith, I can, I can get on board with that. I think I don't really consider either one of them like a running quarterback. I consider them highly mobile pocket passers, which I think is where Wilson could fall into. Uh, Russell Wilson, arm talent wise, I don't know. That's hard. Russell Wilson. I mean, when you're comparing him to like one of the top three quarterbacks in the league right off the bat, I, I think that is. I mean, I guess Aaron Rodgers you're comparing him to, but um, arm talent to Russell Wilson. Yeah, I guess. I guess I could feel. It. I'd have to look at like how accurate Wilson is at the different levels of the field and you know, versus Wilson maybe. And I don't know. I'm not sure what to make of the Russell Wilson comparison. Greenby, what about you? What do you think about uh, Zach Wilson's athleticism? Do you think he's similar to Rodgers and Smith in the athleticism, athletically gifted category? And what do you think of his arm talent compared to Russell Wilson? Um, well, I look, I think he's athletic. You know, I, I don't love the quarterback comparisons. Like every year we, you know, it's just you try to find somebody that he that he you know a guy looks like and all that, but I don't know. I guess I do see the Aaron Rodgers stuff a little bit, but um, I I don't know. I I I think he's athletic enough. I think he's good, but again, I'd rather see him in the pocket than doing all this other stuff. You know, being able to slip pressures and things like that if necessary. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm not really. I think his arm strength is good. Was it Russell Wilson's? Probably not, but maybe. I don't know. That's it. Matt, what do you think about the uh, athletic nature of Zach Wilson? How does he compare to Rodgers and Alex Smith in that regard? And what do you think of his arm talent compared to Russell Wilson? Um, I think, uh, excuse me, I think Zach Wilson's arm talent could be like a smidge higher than Russell Wilson, higher than Russell Wilson which is very lofty expectations, but I just, I, I love, I love the arm talent there. Uh, I don't know if I'd go as far as Aaron Rodgers or Alex Smith. Again, I think I'm kind of between the, the last time we brought this up when we were saying uh, between Darnold or Josh Allen, I think somewhere 
in the middle, closer, maybe a little bit leaning more towards Sam, but higher than Sam, lower than Allen, somewhere in that range, I think. All right, all right, all right. Um, all right. Anthony, dropping in the Super Chat, says, saw a Bleacher Report mock trade, Najoku and 26 for number 23. Thoughts? Uh, he says, eh, for me. Uh, depending on who's on the board at 23, yeah, I'd make that move. Najoku for 26. I, Najoku's got to be going into the last year of his deal, I would think. Um, so to slide back, let's let's do this real quick. Let's see what the trade value chart has to say uh, about that particular dropback. So let's see, from 23 to... It's basically a 60-point swing in terms of value, which is the equivalent of a mid fourth round pick so would you consider giving up a mid fourth round pick for najoku that's basically what we're kind of looking at here uh green bean i'll throw it to you first mid round mid fourth for najoku going from 23 to 26 yeah i saw that um you know what i think it's a really good trade if njoku didn't suck so bad um i just <laughs> don't refer- I, i'm not I'm not the biggest Njoku fan. I mean, he's so uber talented and athletic, but he has these drops. He, he's an inopportune dropper, and I just don't like it. I have a, I have a suspicion, and I actually read an article last year about him that kind of uh, said it, it said what I'm about to say, which is he may not be all that prepared for the higher important games. He doesn't do uh, so well. And don't forget, Njoku was not necessarily a premier tight end either. You know, he's kind of Chris Herndon-esque. I mean, he's better than Chris Herndon, but I don't know. I let me, Before I get too convoluted, I think I would just rather um, take a tight end than bring on garbage from somewhere else. I don't love Njoku. That's an interesting thought, saying that we've already got like Herndon on the roster and Herndon and Njoku could be looked at in similar reclamation project yeah. type things. So why trade back three picks to get someone you already have on the roster? I think that's a valid point. Matt, your thoughts on uh, Njoku? Yeah, you know the Spider-Man meme when they're pointing at each other? That's Herndon and Njoku. I like both players, though. I think I'm the opposite of Green Bean in that. Well, that might be a little bit harsh, but um, I, I'm higher on their upside because they're still young like in joku's only 24 man so i would not take a swing on him because we already have chris herndon and i am giving herndon the one more year to prove it while cleveland is likely going to do the same with Njoku, if that makes sense yeah i think uh i think green bean put it put it perfectly there i think he basically said everything we uh maybe wanted to say i don't know i, I didn't say it all so it... <laughs> I, I didn't help this conversation too much. Um, mm. All right. Let's see. Where is this next one? RJ McPot says, oh, this is not a happy one. He says, prayers go up to Molly Toon. Al Toon's daughter was apparently murdered. Uh, oh. Oh, that is, oh, my God. That is sad. So so prayers go out to, to Molly Toon. Um, hopefully, you know, I, I guess I can't say. Christ. You know, wish the best, but yeah, that's you know, never, never a good oh thing. God. All right, we are getting towards the end of our show, and by getting towards the end of our show, I mean even though we start a few minutes late, thanks to me. Sorry, <laughs> I, uh, we gotta we gotta pick a winner, and I'm looking at the retweets. And if any of you guys wanted a shirt tonight, absolutely, but would have been the way to do it because. We have all but two, uh, it was only two people that did what we asked them to do with the, the really? retweet and tag us. As far as I'm seeing, unless you could see more than me. Actually, no, I'm sorry, three. There were three people. Um, so I've got the three Dude. right here. Yeah, I'm, I'm shocked. You Absolutely guys got to go over I, there and follow this Yeah, guy. I'm blown away i thought for sure uh, maybe they just are retweeting and they're not actually like tagging Tag us. us in it yeah i, I hope maybe, so let, let, let me click into it a little bit maybe they've yeah no it looks like they they just retweeted they didn't uh didn't have many uh 
tagging us in it. All right, all right. You know what? So only three people follow the rules of our of our giveaway tonight. See, listens and follows directions. That's one of the things they grade you on in grade school, my friends. That's it. You're I right. like it. All right. So we got to pick a number one through three. And you know what I'll do? I'm going to write down. Let me see. I think I'm pretty sure two of these three people have won before. But since they followed the directions, um, we are going to uh, give them all the benefit of the doubt. So there you go. I like it. So I have three numbers uh, written down here. They all correspond to a name. Uh, I want the chat to list off a number between one, two, or three, and I'm gonna I'm gonna jot a number. The first one to get to this number, and you don't don't spam it. Just have like individual people do it. So a number one, two, or three. When it gets up to the number that I wrote down, that will be the number uh, that gets it. Let's see. Boom, 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 boom. See, David didn't listen. David's spamming. <laughs> I'm paying attention. I'm looking at it. Uh, oh, Robbie's just throwing all sorts of numbers in here. Robbie, come on. What the hell are you doing? Um, all right. Now I got to scroll up a little bit because now I'm all confuzzled. <laughs> this is, you're throwing me for a loop. Uh, let's see. I see a two, a two, two. Actually, you know what's funny? So, I don't know who DC is. Actually, it's Dom. I don't know if it's oh, the Dom. Dom from... Is that yeah, Dom? Dom? Is, is DC Dom from... I think it could be. Oh, yeah, it is Dom. It might, it might be. Yeah, it might oh, be. Oh, wow. Yeah, I okay. didn't even realize that. I didn't even realize So, that. let's see. We're going Dom? through. What's up, Dom? Um, all right. So, let's see. What number did we see the most? Of? I sh I definitely should have figured this out a little bit better. <laughs> this is, like I'm trying to count all these numbers. I was like, oh, I see this many twos, but how many ones and threes did I see? And how many people said it already? Um, all right. Sirhan puts a 12. That's a one and a two. I guess that kind of... <laughs> or a two and a three from KSE. Oh, you guys stink with numbers. Um, all right. You know what? I'm, I'm confused. I have numbers written down here that Matt and Greenbean do not know. <laughs> so give me a number... Uh, green bean, one, two, or three, three. Ooh, ooh, okay. So let's yeah. see. Let me let me pull it up here. I wrote. I I switched it. So I did. Well, I didn't switch it. But one was Liam. Three was DC. Two was Mutt Vile. So DC, Dom, our boy. That I'm actually happy it worked out that way because I'm pretty sure Liam and Mutt Viles both have won before. Not that they both don't deserve to win, but. It's kind of okay. cool that we spread the love around a little bit. So, uh, Dom, reach out to me. Uh, I'll oh. get your shipping information. You're going to get a super secret shirt. Top secret shirt. That's I know nice. Liam's like, no! <laughs> Poor kid. That's all right. <laughs> Liam Sorry, won dude. the ball trimmer, man. He's good. You yeah. Know? yeah, he's all right. He's he's doing just yeah. fine. He's he's feeling all sorts <laughs> of uh, comfortable. Uh, right. it, it was close, though. I, I, the fact that you three were the only three that did it. Um, that's that boggles my mind. Absolutely boggles Four, my mind. Four hundred and forty-two people chose not to do it, and that's three incredible. people that's chose incredible. to. Uh, I should have done something better. I, I probably should have done something better for this. I, I don't know if I did something wrong or. I, I think I'm looking uh, at it correctly because I'm looking at the retweets, and that's uh, that's what I got. <laughs> I, got I got to see those three. <laughs> Whatever. All right. So make sure you, you, you get out to that. Uh, Marty drops in with the last second super chat. Says, season incentive, Jets playoff, Green Bean shaves beard, Matt shaves head, Ryan grows <laughs> porn star mustache. <laughs> oh, do it. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to see Green Bean lose his beard. I don't want to see Matt shave his head. I'll, I can't I'll... grow a mustache. I'm like Irish. It doesn't happen. Like, I get like... I don't know. I don't get a great mustache. I shouldn't say all Irish people don't do it, but I, I don't grow a good mustache. And then I, I get like not super good growth on the side of the face. I think maybe I'm just baby faced. That's what it is. Look at him. I don't know. You know, what? how about this? I'll shave my beard. Uh, or actually I could probably do my head. I probably have the least hair of all of us. 
Matt will shave his beard, and Green Bean will grow a mustache. Right? Boom. I'll, See, I'll shave my eyelashes. I'll shave my I'll eyelashes. I'll shave my. How's that? I'll. I will shave a mustache into my ball sack. All right, boys and girls, we Ooh. have reached the end of our panel. Uh, <laughs> let's go around. Let's get some closing thoughts. Uh, Green Bean, bring us home. What are you thinking? How did you enjoy tonight? Give everyone the lowdown and where. You got what you got coming up and where they can find it. Oh, yeah. We got some cool shit. Number one, I want to thank Matt O'Leary for, for Peyton Hendergrass, whatever his name was. I got him pulled up over here. Peyton Hendershot. There it is. There you go. Peyton Hender, Hender. But I want to tell you guys, it's getting closer and closer. I have something going on in New Jersey for March 22nd. Uh, we are going to put together a full a Jersey Shore coaster tour. We're going to be, from what I understand, the first family to ever ride every roller coaster in the Jersey Shore in one day. We have a charity associated with that, a, um, a uh, dog shelter in New Jersey that had really got hit hard with COVID and they got to keep their doors open. I already have like four of the peers involved. And we're going to get it in the papers and everything like that. So I'll let everybody know how they can pledge and donate and all that kind of stuff. But, yeah, we're real excited about it. We're going to ride every coaster, all 22 of them on, on the Jersey Shore in one day. So I'll keep you posted. I love it. And I think there was someone in here earlier. I made a bet with someone that Sam Darnold would be traded before the draft. And... I don't remember who that was. They made a comment earlier in the stream, so I'd have to go back and look for it. But the, the bet was a $100 bet going towards a charity. So let's do this. If you see it in the chat, that $100 bet, whoever that was with, that's going to go directly to Green Bean's charity that he's doing for his his uh, his thing. So if you link up with me at that point, let me know, and I'll get in touch with Green Bean. We'll figure it out all that way and go to a good cause. Matt. Oh, sorry, Green Bean. Yeah, I just wanted to say they. Somebody said I said March twenty second. I did mean May twenty second. So just for clarification. <laughs> fair, fair enough, Matt. Any last words for our panel? Love it. I am itching towards the draft. I cannot wait for our draft. So I just, I kind of wanted to use my time to plug that. You better freaking tune in to when we do this draft stream because. Actually, the Jets tweeted out a reaction when Denzel Mims was drafted, so I had to take that clip of us reacting last year because we had that <laughs> epic reaction of let's bleeping go when he was yeah. drafted. So I am super excited to do that once again this year with y'all. Oh, dude, I can't wait. I'm so excited for our draft panel. We're going to have a lot of fun. We're giving away two jerseys for the, the, the 23rd pick, the second pick. So make sure you tune into that. The link is in the description. It's the top link for that play page. Aaron35, thank you so much for becoming the newest member of the Jets Talks. My voice, I have a channel. I love you, brother. Uh, members only mock every Tuesday after the Talking Jets panel. This Tuesday tonight, I'm going to take a rain check, guys. I really apologize. I am so tired. I, I got to work at 6 a.m. and I did not get home until just before this stream. So uh, I'm going to take the night off uh, this week. But we will be back at it to, uh, next Tuesday, and I will do the, uh, the mock draft then. Uh, boys and girls, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for flying with us tonight. My name's Ryan. I've been your pilot tonight. J-E-T-S! <laughs>